Well, uh, good morning. Thank you for um, uh, coming out this early and, and being willing to come and listen to me. Um, I, I, I considered that the fact is that I would be speaking at 9.30 in the morning, and the last thing that you would probably want is a lecture with a lot of bullet points and so on. And in fact, I've always found story to be a much more accessible way to learn, uh, to be encouraged uh, by the Lord, and to actually see some success in our lives. And so, you know, when we think about telling anyone about Jesus, I'm not even thinking about Jewish people, but just anyone. And we had the morning prayers this morning a few minutes ago. One of the things we prayed about was sort of coming out from this place and being a witness. And of course, the thought of that can be quite scary, can't it? I'd almost say it can be terrifying. That might be an overstatement. But um, how many of us are really, um, you know, struggle with going out and sharing the good news of Jesus with the people that God has put in our lives. I have to be honest with you, even as somebody who's been a missionary for 39 years, I struggle with sharing the good news with my neighbors. You know, I struggle with sharing the good news with the people who are around me in my community. Um, probably, um, we think and the way that we've been raised and the context of our lives and the way that you um, can make an impact into seeing us come to a saving faith. Now, I actually uh, travel a lot in, in my job as um, the CEO of International Mission to Jewish People, and I go to the Far East a lot. And quite often, I remember I was riding in a car in, in Seoul in Korea, and uh, my driver is a Christian man, he's just very kindly taking me to my meeting, and he said, uh, you don't look Jewish. And I said, oh, really, what, what do I look like? He said, you look like uh, Father Christmas. It's literally what he said. I said, okay. <laughs> and the fact is, is that there is this, uh, this misunderstanding that Jewish people have a look. But the truth is, is actually uh, Jewish people, we look all sorts of ways. Um, you know, uh, you've got Ashkenazi Jewish people, like my background, sort of very uh, white European looking Jewish people. You've got um, Sephardic Jewish people, um, like uh, bottom left, Tomer. These are actually... Um, all of our, a number of our missionaries, so they're all people I know. So Tomer uh, is a Sephardic background. He's a missionary in Sydney and Australia. Um, you know, you've got a couple of Ukrainians, three Ukrainians actually on that, um, four, in fact. So, you know, um, and also, you know, we're, we're seeing God working amongst Falasha Jewish people. Those are Jewish people from Ethiopia, so Jewish people who are black. And even in China, there are, are Jewish people who look Chinese. And I could go on and talk to you about the history of, of China and uh, Jewish people and the Jewish, ancient Jewish community there. The Lord did a really great job of spreading us around the world. And people sort of say, well, how can Jewish people look so different but still be Jewish? But you have to remember that, you know, um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, how many wives did he have? How many uh, different backgrounds were there and the different children uh, from the different wives? I know that two were sisters, so half the kids would have the same ethnic background, but the other two wouldn't, and so on. And then, um, you know, so just sort of use your imagination there, and then, of course, Jewish people, um, we were a proselytizing religion for centuries, um, up until around 2,000 years ago, or not even, and so on. So there's all sorts of things that um, make us a diverse community. There isn't uh, a Jewish look, um, and there's not actually a specific um, way to understand what it means to be Jewish. And so, and I'm going to hit this again later on in the seminar, to think that you need to learn and understand everything about Jewish people uh, before you can share the gospel with us is really just not true, and it'll be impossible anyway. I can tell you as somebody who, my, my first uh, degree was in Jewish studies when I was training to be a missionary, and the diversity within the Jewish community is absolutely huge. And so take myself, for example, I'm standing here with an American accent. Um, how, did I, how did I get that? My family only immigrated to the States uh, about um, 120 years ago because of uh, persecution um, by the Cossacks. How many of you familiar with the film Fiddler on the Roof? A few of you? You know, that story at the end when the, the, um, the Russian Orthodox Christians come and say, you have three days to pack up your stuff and go. You can only take with you what you can carry on your back. Everything else is being taken from you. That was the story of my great-grandfather Jacob. And so he had to help you know, travel down the Trans-Siberian Railway, help build it. He was a civil engineer, was helping to build the stations. Ended up in Tashkent in Uzbekistan, where he saved up enough money to immigrate to the United States because we lost everything. 
And so, you know, raised in, in, in that, that context, you know, I wasn't raised as a religious Jewish person, but I was very much raised as a Jewish person. And my father taught me and my two brothers and my sister, be very careful. We're living in a Gentile community and we need to mix in. We need to blend in. We don't want to stand out because we were, my father was a teenager when the news of the Holocaust broke. And so there's this fear, there's this us and them, and yet we need to not let people see us in them, but we need to be careful because we need to preserve ourselves. You know, so often when you think of a Jewish people, you think of uh, somebody who's got that um, black hat and the side curls and the outfit, you know, um, that's, um, uh, a very ultra-Orthodox Jewish person, but they're the minority, although they are a growing um, minority uh, because of the way uh, they have so many children and the way the community works. But um, they're still a minority. The religious are a minority within the entire Jewish community. Most Jewish people, I would say, would be much more secular, um, much less religious, and yet having um, a... Um, a semi-religious identity, you know, it doesn't even mean so, you know, my parents weren't sure if there was a God, they're very agnostic, you know, um, and in fact, so the home that I was raised in, um, I was raised with two basic beliefs, okay, when I was six years old, we were going to synagogue on a Friday night, uh, which was very unusual, we didn't go to synagogue that often, but we happened to be going this evening, and um, on this evening, uh, my father looked up in the stars and he said, you know, son, one day the Messiah will come. I was six years old. One day the Messiah will come and he will bring peace to the earth. And the lion will lay with the lamb. And the nations, because they'll be at peace, will take their weapons for war and turn them into tools for farming. And I was inspired. My father planted a seed of hope of eternity into my heart because when the Messiah comes, everyone will live forever and all these things will happen. Um, but what I found out later, in fact, was... That's a fairy tale, a fable. My father didn't believe in a Messiah. My mother didn't believe in a Messiah. That, that hope amongst Jewish people, at least um, non-religious Jewish people, was killed in the Holocaust because if the Messiah was ever going to come, he would have come to rescue six million Jewish people. So my parents, the, uh, their idea is very much of a messianic age. Um, it's an age that we work towards, that we work together for, to have peace in the world because God's not going to do it. We have to do it. And so you'll find that Jewish people are very much activists trying to find ways to make the world a better place, trying to find ways to bring peace, because, well, I, I'm not sure if there's a God. The Messiah is a fable. It's a fairy tale that we teach our children until they know better, kind of like you teach your kids about, you know, Father Christmas or Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny. Not that you necessarily do that, but that a lot of people do that. But what my father didn't know was that God's Spirit used that, because I tell you, that hope, because what my father also didn't know, that from about the age of six, and I, I, you know, call me a very morbid person. But from the age of six, just before I started school, I remember lying in my bed and looking up at the ceiling and just thinking, I'm going to start school soon. I'm going to go to school and I'm going to learn and I'm going to grow up and I'm going to get married and I'm going to have children. And I'm going to gain wisdom and a profession and all these things. And then I'm going to die. And I'm going to hear one last laugh and I'm just going to disappear into nothingness. And that caused me, even at the age of six, this, this hopeless despair and fear of death. You know, and so when my father told me about the Messiah, I had this hope. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's true. So that was the first thing. Okay, um, is that one day the Messiah will come and uh, bring peace to the earth? The other thing that um, I was taught, and that ties into what I said about persecution, was that we can never believe in Jesus and still be Jewish. In fact, I grew up in a uh, in a very non-Jewish community. We were the only Jewish family. I was the only Jewish boy in my school. And often I would get the question, Joseph, what do Jewish people believe? And I would always give this, the answer I was taught and that I believed, we don't believe in Jesus. And the teacher would say, you know, at Christmas, I remember one Christmas, Joseph, what do Jewish people believe? And like, we don't believe in Jesus. And I can tell you that kind of um, almost aggressive answer, we don't believe in Jesus, does stop people in their tracks. It saves you from a lot of evangelistic encounters, you know. You know, we don't believe in Jesus, that's what we believe. You know, and, and so my family moved a lot. I don't know why, but in a 10-year period, we moved nine times. Very nomadic. Around the same city, we moved from uh, one place 1,000 miles, but then nine times in 10 years around the same city. I don't know whether that's just the best way that we saw to clean the house and go to another place. I don't know what it was, but we moved a lot, and it was very unsettling to a degree. But the last time we moved, and where we finally stayed in a place for a few years at least, 
I was 13 years old. Now, if you know anything about Jewish life, 13 is when uh, you have a bar mitzvah if you were a boy or a bat mitzvah if you were a girl. It's basically when you become responsible in the eyes of the community for your own sins. You have to take responsibility for your, the decisions that you take in your life. Um, you are responsible, not, you know, your parents. And so um, I, I was 13 years old, and, you know, I was beginning to develop a, a sense of uh, spiritual, a greater sense of spiritual interest and so on, thinking more about God. Uh, that fear that I had was getting uh, deeper and darker, and um, we moved to this new neighborhood. And so within a week, I'm out at the front of my house sitting on the doorstep, and my father has got this rake, and he's just tidying up this new front garden that we have in this new house. And suddenly, this young man, you know, I was, like I said, 13. He was about 15 years old. He just walks up to my father in the front garden, and he says, Oh, welcome to the neighborhood, Mr. Steinberg. I'd like to tell you about my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> and uh, my father's reaction was, um, I just won't ever forget it, really. Um, he probably won't remember it, but, um, you know, it was like, we're Jewish. We don't believe in Jesus. Get off my property, you know. And uh, this, that was the end of the conversation. This guy had to get off and out of our front garden and go back to where he came from. Uh, so his name was Mark. And uh, the next time I met Mark was about a week, week and a half later. Uh, it was evening. It was about 6 p.m. around dinner time. My mother and father both worked. My mother had got home from work to, to make dinner. And the doorbell went. And uh, I was curious, 13-year-old, the doorbell went, my mother went to the door, and I was standing behind her, I was quite tall, and I was looking over her shoulder, and when she opened it, uh, there was Mark standing at the door. He said, good evening, Mrs. Steinberg, we're going to every home in the neighborhood uh, from our church, just distributing these leaflets to let you know that God loves you, and I'd like to tell you about my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And my mother said, we're Jewish. We don't believe in Jesus. And she slammed the door in his face. It's like, wow, this guy's persistent, you know. Uh, and so that was that. And then a few days after that, it was uh, the middle of the next week, and it was summertime in the States. So we'd have like three months where you don't have school, and there's not a lot to do. My sister went up to the uh, local shops with another uh, group of young people from the neighborhood just trying to get to know people like we had only been there a couple of weeks or so. And uh, up at the shops, there was this guy, Mark, again. And he started sharing or trying to share the gospel with her. And, of course, she immediately shut him down. We're Jewish. We don't believe in Jesus. Stop talking to us about Jesus. And she left and she went home. And she was in a strop. And she came in and I said, Sarah, uh, what's wrong? She said, oh, this guy, Mark, he tried to tell me about Jesus. I'm just so annoying, you know. And that was the end of that. So, you know, three strikes. And um, there's Mark for you. Very persistent. So... A few days after that, I'm really bored. It's the summertime. I'm 13 years old. You're not old enough to have a job when you're 13. You can get a job at 14, at least back then, you know. And um, so I'm sitting on my back step uh, of my house, and I hear the sound of a basketball hitting uh, the driveway. And I look up, and two, two houses up is where Mark lives. Um, I didn't know that yet, but I was just seeing that. And he was playing basketball. He had a hoop on, the, on his garage, you know, that typical American thing. And I thought, wow, you know what, let's shoot some hoops. You know, I didn't think anything of it. Um, call me naive, but um, you can probably guess what happened. I went up there, and we got the ball, and we started shooting. And within a minute, maybe two, he holds on to the ball. Okay? He holds on to the ball, and he wanted to be my friend. Okay? So this guy had been rejected three times. He holds on to the ball, and he says, you know what, uh, Joseph, I... I moved here two years ago. My parents got divorced, and I was so unhappy because I had to move in with my mother and her new husband. And I was miserable. I started trying out drugs and alcohol and doing vandalism and girls and all sorts of different things, and I could find no peace. I only made myself more miserable. He said a year passed, and he said last summer I was sitting in, uh, in my lounge, and I was flicking through the channels on the television one after the other, and I stopped on this television preacher. And this guy said, if you want to know God's peace, if you want to know God's love, if you want to know God's forgiveness, then get up out of your chair right now and come and put your hands on the television and pray this prayer of repentance. Repent of your sin. 
Come to a holy God and ask him to forgive you of your sin and put your trust and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And God will forgive you. He will fill you with his love and he will give you new life. And, and so Mark got out of his chair, put his hands on the television, he told me, and prayed this prayer. And he said, you know what, Joseph? My life was absolutely changed a year ago and I cannot stop talking to people about Jesus. And I said, I noticed. <laughs> you know... Um, he said, okay, so what do you believe? Do you know what I said? Very good, you're paying attention. I'm Jewish. I don't believe in Jesus. And Mark said the most profound thing to me that I had ever heard up to that, uh, the first 13 years of my life. He said to me, I asked you what you believe, not what you don't believe. What I positively believe in, not what I don't believe. I, I, I think that there's a, a Messiah who will come one day. And bring peace to the earth. But I'm not quite sure. I hope that's true. Um, I don't really know a lot more than that. You know, I have a fear of death. I don't know what's going to happen when we die. But I'm afraid that there's going to be nothing there. And I don't know. He said, you know what? He said, why don't you read the Bible? To find out what God expects from you. As a Jewish person. Read the Bible. And uh, I was... I was like, you know what, that's, that's a really good idea. Why, why not read the Bible? I'm really interested, actually. I don't know anything about it, okay? And that, that actually, um, that might surprise you. Um, here, we became friends. I wanted a friend. I was lonely. I didn't have any friends. We moved to a new neighborhood. We moved every year. I didn't, he didn't know. But, you know, and the thing is, he didn't stop, did he? He didn't stop with my father. He didn't stop with my mother. He didn't stop with my sister. He kept going. And then here he is. God's been working on my heart for years. I want a friend. And this guy's willing to be my friend, even if he's saying things I don't want to hear, I don't like, and challenging me. And so uh, we became friends. He became my best friend. He became a wonderful friend. And that was unconditional because at that stage, I still despised Jesus because of all that my people suffered in his name and because of what I had been taught about him, which was very little, but that our problems were because of him and people killed us in his name and so on. So, and yet he was willing to be my friend and I was willing to have him as my friend. And when he challenged me to read the Bible, I was willing to take up that challenge. And he, he said, what? <laughs> he was surprised. You're going to read the Bible? I said, yeah, I'm going, to go, I'm going to go home now. We just moved, but I know where the box is, where the books are. And I'm sure that uh, my father has a Tanakh. That's what we Jewish people call the Old Testament, the Torah and the, the Nevi'im and the Ketuvim, the Law of the Prophets and the Writings. So the Tanakh. I said, I'm sure my father has one uh, in, in the box of books. He goes, well, hang on a minute before you go. Um, if you're going to read the Bible, whenever you read it, then just pray this prayer for me, please. I said, what? He said, say, God, if this is your word, please speak to me through it. I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll pray that. No, no, biggie, God, if this is your word, speak to me through it. He said, yeah. I remember that because I, I prayed it every day for a year as I read the Bible. So I went home, and uh, here's the thing, okay. Um, <clears throat> you think, how many of you think je at least religious Jewish people know the Bible really well? Yeah? Okay, or um, what about even non-religious Jewish people? Do we get, okay. Actually, none of us know the Bible really well. Not even religious Jewish people, because if you're not religious, well, the Bible's a book, my parents believed the, and taught me the Bible was a book of fables, you know, like, like Aesop's fables, stories to teach you things about God, but it's not true. And then the religious or orthodox Jewish people, they study um, books written by the rabbis where they discuss things about religious Jewish life and discuss things about the Bible, but they don't study the Tanakh. Okay, we have readings in the synagogue, but some, but it's their specific readings. For instance, are, are you familiar with Isaiah chapter 53 about the suffering servant? Do you know that's never read in the synagogue? It's forbidden. We don't read it in the synagogue. So we never read it. We never read Isaiah 53. So we're unfamiliar with it. So Jewish people really do not know the Bible. And, and I just wanted to make that point. We don't know the scriptures at all. You know way more of the scriptures than a Jewish person. So don't feel intimidated. Okay, you already know more than we do. Okay, so I went home. I went into um, the room that we had all the boxes uh, still stuffed in there, and I found in the corner this box full of books. And down in the box was my father's uh, Tanakh. And here's the just to illustrate the point. Okay, I opened this book up, and it was like 70 years old, and it had a woman's uh, a woman's name in it, not my dad's name. So when my dad came home from work, then I said, "Dad, I found your Tanakh." And I saw this woman's name. Who, who's Deborah? Why is her name in your Bible? He said, 
Oh, well, you know, we're really poor. That's another thing that Jewish people are rich. No, we, we, we're not. There's a few, I'm sure, like all across the world, you know, just like in every people group. But we were quite poor, as my father was and so on. We were, you know, immigrants. And so um, he said, well, you know, when I was uh, bar mitzvah, I, we were too poor to go and buy a new Bible. So we went to the used bookstore and we got this used one. And this woman, uh, she must have had it first for her bat mitzvah. And then eventually it went into the store and whatever, you know, she handed it in. And, and then my parents bought it for me for my bar mitzvah. And there it sat in this box. Because like my father must have been, I don't know, in his 40s by then. And, had, and the, I'm going to tell you this. This book looked brand new. The spine didn't have a crack on it. The pages didn't have a wrinkle. It had never been thumbed through. The only thing was inside this woman's name. And the book was like 70 years old. That's how much that book was ever read. Um, until, by God's grace, I got a hold of it. <laughs> I still have it now, obviously. And so every day for a year, um, I, I open up the Bible. I didn't know where to start, so I thought I'll start at the beginning. Genesis, right? I mean, that's the first page. You read a book from left to right. There, there it was, Genesis. And every day for a year, I read the Old Testament. Every day for a year, before I read, I said, God, if this is your word, please speak to me through it. And I really meant that. And as I read it, I was trying to, you know, um, get something out of it. Try to find out about God and how he dealt with my people and how they had a relationship with him and what is he like. And, of course, what I discovered as I read it as a 13-year-old going into a 14-year-old was that God is holy. And that, gosh, we really do mess up a lot. when We're sinful. Um, and I just kept seeing this divide, you know, God's hopes and his, you know, his desires continually being dashed and disappointed, and yet God continually, faithfully finding a way to save his people. I mean, if you, when you read the Old Testament, do you see that? That's what I love about the book of Judges, you know. It's a series of like, you know, everything goes up really great, and then the, the judge messes up, and everything goes down, the people depart from God, and then God brings another judge. It's just this ongoing cycle, and it seems like kind of like the cycle of, uh, of life for the church and, and so on. You know, God just longs to continue to break in and, and bring salvation. And that's what I kept seeing, you know. And I really took a sense of pride in reading about my people in the Scripture. I felt like I was, I was reading my family tree, my family history. And it was really exciting. But I also felt the more I read, the more I was aware of this divide between me and God. Even though I was a 13-year-old and I wasn't doing anything bad, I wasn't a bad person but I also, as I had been aware of when I was six, I wasn't in the right place either. I wasn't in, you know, I had a Christian friend now, Mark, and I had so many questions as I was reading, and I had so many questions for him because of what I was reading. And so we spoke almost every day, and I also asked my parents similar questions because I wanted them to have a fair shot at answering my questions as well. I think they were going, they thought maybe I was going a little bit doolally, but, you know, I was asking all sorts of questions. And, you know, he kept talking about Jesus, and I was, I know, you know, I don't want to talk about Jesus. I, he, I know that he's not the Messiah, you know, and so on. And we had all these, uh, these great conversations. But what I was really, I just loved spending time with him because he just made me more thirsty for what he had. I could see that he had a loving relationship with God, that God was his father. I knew that I didn't have the same relationship with God that he did. You know, he was so um, personal with and about God. You could see something there. And he made me envious you know, and jealous of his faith, which is, which is exactly what Paul says in Romans 10, the church is supposed to do. Make them envious, make them jealous, you know, so that they will too also be drawn to faith. And that's what God was doing through this 15-year-old. And let me tell you, right, he said some crazy things too. You know, those were the days, you know, we're talking about 1978, okay? Those were the days in America when Hal Lindsey's late great planet Earth was going around and you know, all this end time stuff and antichrist stuff. And he was like, you know, Joseph, pretty soon Jesus is coming and I'm going to be riding with him on a horse through the sky. And when I come past you, I will wave from the horse. I'll wave down at you. I'm like, this guy's it's got some of that acid left over from a year ago. I don't know what he's talking about, but it didn't matter. I mean, he, he said a number of crazy things um, and I just thought he was a bit loopy. But his genuine love for God and I could see God's love in him, that continue to draw me to God. And the thing that drove me nuts was he kept talking about, oh, the New Testament. I have a new covenant. God's given me a new heart. He's placed within me a new spirit. I mean, I could go on new, 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 new all the time. And as a very proud Jewish person reading the, the Old Testament, I'm like, what's wrong with the old, 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 old? Hey, man, you know, we got the history. You know, we go way back. Why are you trying to replace us here? What's all this new stuff, you know? 
Uh, and that was just troubling me more and more. And I'm searching the Bible uh, for the Messiah because I, I want to prove it's not Jesus. And um, I was really, uh, you know, really struggling. So a year passes. It's the following summer. Um, now Mark is uh, 16. He's old enough to not only have a license but to get a job. And he's gone away uh, for a week or two to work in a factory. He's no longer there for me to ask my daily questions for. And, you know, I mean, it's funny because, like, um, he had uh, been, once he got a license, we would go to school. And Mark was very intent on praying before he drove the car. So I got a ride to school with him rather than having to take the bus. And that was amazing. But the downside was that he always insisted on praying before he drove. And we would get in the car, and he would hold his hand out, and I had to hold his hand. <laughs> I wasn't anything funny. That's just the way the Bible belt is in America. And he's like, and then he would bow his head and he'd say, Say, God, please help me to drive well. Please don't let us have an accident. Please help me to get us to school safely. We commit this journey to you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And then I would rip my hand away and say, in Jesus' name you pray. I don't pray in Jesus' name. And that was like a ritual every day. He would pray in Jesus' name, and I would say, no, I deny Jesus. You pray in his name. I don't, you know. Because, you know, again, I had this, this, this I despise Jesus for all that, all that he or that all that was done to my people in his name, okay? And how, how was God going to overcome that? But he just faithfully stayed my friend, faithfully continued to share the gospel, faithfully lived the gospel, and just didn't, you know, he was just young and naive, and that was brilliant. That's what we need to be, okay? So, uh, you know, just to give you that little insight. So it's the a, it's a following year, and one day, I don't know about you, when you have a quiet time, do you ever, like, let your mind, your mind just go somewhere else, and you did the Bible reading, and then you thought, wow, I missed that whole passage, I got to reread it now because my mind was thinking about, oh, it's today rubbish day and I got to take the rubbish out and I just totally missed that. So that happened to me even in that year. I didn't every day, even though I said God speak to me, I wasn't always paying attention. And uh, so uh, I'm, I'm reading on this particular day. And so, for instance, I read through all the way. I'm, I mean, we're, I'm way into the uh, Old Testament now. I'm all the way up in the prophets. I've already gotten all the way through Isaiah. I read Isaiah 53, but I didn't notice it. I must have been daydreaming that day. Now I'm in Jeremiah, the prophet. And on this particular day, I'm in Jeremiah 31. And I get to verse 31, and I had this really, really weird existential experience of the numinous. You know what that is? That's theological language for I had a God moment. Okay? Um, suddenly, as I'm looking uh, at the page, when I got to verse 31, the words were like a fish. They kind of flipped on the page a bit, and it scared me. And I was like, what? Um, and, of course, you're familiar with the passage, but I'm going to read it to you anyway. This is what I read, and it really grabbed me. Don't forget, my question is, new, new, new. Why all this new? What's wrong with the old? Why can't we just stick with the old? Why are, what's going on here? And this is what God says in Jeremiah 31. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, because I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. And I was struck through the heart when I read that, because what I saw was, God has consistently been faithful, a faithful husband. My people have consistently been unfaithful, but God will not let us go. And so he's going to make a new covenant. He's going to forgive our sins. He's going to uh, renew our relationship with him through this new covenant. And maybe all that Mark's been saying for the last year, maybe Jesus has something to do with that. Now, Mark had been telling me, look, you're reading the Old Testament. Why don't you try the New Testament, okay? And here's the thing about Jewish people in the New Testament. We have a bit of a fear of it. I certainly did. Uh, back in the day when I was young, believe it or not, I had a big old curly afro, okay? That's why I don't have any hair now. It's some kind of a curse. I should have never had that hairstyle, and now my hair is all gone. But back then I had this curly hair, and I had this fear, like if I, he'd say, read the New Testament, like if I ever open that book, Bats are going to fly out of that book and get tangled in my hair. You know, I don't know. Um, we, there's a real, if I started telling you, if I started reading to you from the Book of Mormon right now, 
I think that you would be seriously um, upset, wouldn't you? You'd be, you'd be, what is this man? What are we doing? You would complain and I would never be allowed back again, right? That's kind of the feeling that we have about the New Testament. Um, even in our evangelism as a mission, when we're out there and we start to read Isaiah 53, which really sounds like the New Testament, a Jewish person would say, don't read to me from the New Testament. Don't, I, I'm not listening to you if you're going to read to me from the New Testament. I'm not reading to you from the New Testament. I'm reading to you from our prophet, Isaiah. Isaiah. This is Isaiah 53. Let me just read this passage. Look, it's from the Tanakh. It's not from the New Testament. So this is fear, uh, I would say, of the New Testament. No, I'm not going to touch that. That's a forbidden book. We don't read that book. So Mark had been for this year kind of saying, why don't you, you know, these guys lived with Jesus. Why don't you, you know, read a little bit about him, find out a bit more. You're so opposed to him, but you don't know anything about him. So here's the thing. Mark's gone. I read, I read this passage from Jeremiah. I am struck through the heart. What am I going to do? And um, I remembered that about three years earlier, I'd been in school. And one day the teacher came in and she lined us all up at the door and she said, I want, we're going to go across to the other side of the, of the school. I want you to march in single file till we get there. No, no monkey business, no messing around. And uh, I'll talk to you when we get to, the, to this classroom. I said, okay. So we all march over single file to this other classroom. And when we get there and we look into the door, uh, there's a table set up at the front and um, there's these two men in suits behind the table, and there's a banner uh, at the front, and all these New Testaments are stacked up, and it says, the Gideons. You ever heard of the Gideons? Of course you have, right? And the teacher, knowing there's this little Jewish boy in her classroom, who like, you know, I'm Jewish, I don't believe in Jesus, you know. Look, children, we're going to go in single file in front of this table. If you want one of their New Testaments, then please feel free to take it. If you don't want one, it's okay. Just keep your hands by your side and walk past. And that's all well and good, but don't forget, my father taught us to survive, to blend in, and I had a crisis, you know, as a sort of 10-year-old, what am I supposed to do? Um, if I take this New Testament, I'm touching this forbidden book. If I don't take it, I might get beaten up. I'm supposed to blend in. And I've got all of about, you know, 20 seconds to figure out what I'm going to do, because I'm in the middle of the queue of line, you know, and all the kids are going to see whether I, this Jewish boy, takes a New Testament or not. So we're walking up, and I'm like, oh, what do I do? And as we went by, I was, took a New Testament. And I, I got back to the room, and I'm like, now what do I do, this, do with this thing? You know, if I throw it away and they find it in the bin, they're going to know that it was, a, it was a Jewish kid that threw it in the bin. And then I'm going to get beaten up. But I, I'm not, I shouldn't take this home, this forbidden object, home to my, to my house. What do I do? So in the end, uh, the fear of getting beaten up was greater than the fear of my parents. So I put it in my rucksack. I took it home, and I put it in a shoebox that I kept various little things in in my closet. And then every time we moved, that shoebox just got moved as well. So when I finished reading Jeremiah 31, um, and this is to illustrate that, you know, God is trying to help you. God is at work with you. God wants to save people, whatever your friend is, whether they're Jewish or Muslim or Buddhist or whatever, or just a normal British person with a Christian background. God's helping you, okay? I go into my closet, I open up the shoebox, and there's that Gideon's New Testament. The, Mark never knew the Gideons were helping him, but they had. Even before I ever knew him, the Gideons had already done what they need to do. I go in there, I get out this New Testament, and, and I'm holding it. I've never opened it except to put my name in it. Um, and then um, I say, well, what do I do? I, all right, I don't know where to start. I don't know anything about this book. So I just say, God, if this is your word, please speak to me through it. And I opened it up, and the first page I came to was the Gospel of Matthew, and I began to read it. Now, I really knew nothing about Jesus except that he died this miserable death. Who would, he was, to me, he was the weakest man who ever lived. Like, who wouldn't defend himself? And I, I would never, I would fight right to the end. You're not going to see me walking to my execution. I'm going to fight all the way. You're going to have to probably kill me on the journey because I am not just going to let you get away with it. So I didn't, I didn't um, admire Jesus. You know, I, as I said, I despised him. This is a weak guy. Who wants to be like him, you know? But as I read the New Testament, my mind was absolutely blown away. My whole attitude was changed because I was ignorant, I didn't really know anything about the story of Jesus. I didn't know anything about the life of Jesus. I didn't know anything about the teachings of Jesus, except some of the things that Mark told me. I didn't really know. 
But as I read the Gospel of Matthew, I was blown away. And you know, I spent that year in the Old Testament, and I was seeing things that Jesus was doing which are radical. You know, um, on my mother's side, our, 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 we're Cohens. You know what that means when your surname is Cohen? In Hebrew, Kohanim, that means we're the sort of the priestly, uh, you know, the lineage of, um, you know, it's a, it's a Levite family of the lineage of, of um, Moses and Aaron. Um, so the Kohanim were the priests and so on. So when I'm reading Leviticus. I'm really interested in Leviticus and all the stuff. Like, for instance, leprosy. I bet you probably don't love the book of Leviticus very much. I really loved it. I still do. Um, and <laughs> so I know when you have leprosy, you know, you have to stay away. No one can touch you or they become unclean. So you can imagine when I'm reading the story of Jesus and the leper, and the leper's like, you know, you know the thing. They wear a bell around their neck. Unclean, unclean, stay away. And if I was the Messiah, I would go and say, hey, uh, you leper, be healed. Are you healed now? I'm coming over. But Jesus just goes up and hugs the guy. And the guy is no longer a leper. Jesus isn't unclean. The leper is uh, unlepered, right? She says, go and present yourself at the temple. You're not, you're not unclean. The power of God. You see, Jewish people, we think functionally, not didactically. We don't, we don't think with, you make a statement and that makes it true. You've got to prove it. You've got to put your money where your mouth is. That's why, you know, when the man is lowered through the roof and Jesus says, so that you may know that his sins are forgiven because uh, Jewish people thought that uh, you were sick because your sin. So, so that you may know his sins are forgiven, he's healed. Rise, take up your bed and go home. And that's when they said they plotted to kill him because he was demonstrating his power as God in human flesh. Okay, so I'm reading all these stories and God is blowing my mind. Oh my gosh, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the one. And the thing that really got me was when I came to Jesus' death, because as Jesus faces Jerusalem, he says, no one takes my life from me, but I willingly lay it down. And he went, I could see with purpose and intent, and all that Mark had shared with me was finally making sense. He went as that suffering servant to pay the penalty for my sin. To make me one, to make me right with a holy God, you know. And so uh, when I saw his death, when I read about it there at the end of Matthew, and I was thinking that Jesus was going to die crying out for his mother, gurgling in his own blood. But instead, I see the strength. When all that he came to accomplish was fulfilled, he cries out, it is finished. And Matthew says, and he gave up his spirit. You understand, he was in control of even when he died. He wasn't mugged by death, he conquered death. And then, of course, I read about his resurrection. And when I got to the end of the story, I knew that I couldn't just sit on the fence. That either I was going to follow uh, my sinful heart and continue to deny him, or I was going to follow the conviction of God's spirit. And I was going to submit to the truth that Jesus is the Messiah. The problem was that I had been so ingrained with this fear that we Jewish people must never worship false gods. You know, I was afraid, but I had learned to pray just by praying that prayer every day. And so I said, God, you know, I'm finished with the story. I really want to believe in Jesus, but I'm afraid. I know that you're a holy God. I know that you've commanded us Jewish people, you know, that we should have no other gods before you. Uh, and I'm afraid. So I tell you what, God, you know, I'm, I'm 14. I'm like, God, I'm going to make a deal with you. I'm going to ask Jesus into my life as Lord and Savior. Okay. And if he's true, you know, show me. And I'll keep following him. And if he's not true, show me and I'll repent. I'll reject him. I'll come back, you know, away from that. And so I just got on my knees. Um, and um, it was the 31st of July, so two days from now, um, 1979. I just got on my knees at my bed. I was in my room because Mark was away. There wasn't anyone else. I wasn't going to talk about it with my family. I got on my knees and I said, Lord God, please forgive me of my sins because of what Jesus did for me on the cross. Lord Jesus, please come into my life. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. Help me to follow you. God, you know, help me to, 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 to be the person that you want me to be. You know, amen. And you know, um, there wasn't any angels that showed up and fed me manna. There weren't any fireworks or anything. But God had brought me to that point of um, acknowledgement of the Lordship of Jesus, the Messiahship of Jesus, Jesus the Savior. And, you know, for the first time, I knew <clears throat> peace with God. And that only became more and more evident as the days rolled on. You know, um, I, I wanted to, uh, I, don't, I didn't understand what baptism was. Mark came back from this factory where he was working and I told him. He was disappointed. He was like, oh man. I was like, what's wrong? He's like, I wanted to pray with you to receive Jesus. I'm like, well, <laughs> you know what? I don't teach you to be a scalp hunter, brother. You know, but, uh, you know, but God used him. Obviously, God, it's the spirit of God in the end. That's the other thing. Is, you know, you don't have to trust yourself. Trust the spirit. 
He didn't have to be there. God was doing something. But God used him, and God can use you. And God has used me, and we just have to be faithful to let our light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Amen? Amen. So, you know, that, that's what it's about, and that's what he did, even as a 15, 16-year-old. And, um, you know, it, I, I said to him when he got back, I said, what is baptism? And he explained to me what baptism was. And I was like, I don't know why, but I really want to be baptized. And eventually we arranged for me to secretly um, uh, be brought out by his uh, two pastors at his church into, into the forest where there was a stream. And I was secretly baptized uh, in the stream. And I tell you what, I was ear to ear grinning. It was after school. I had my school clothes on. And I had to wait like three hours before I could go home dry. You know, so that because like imagine coming in wet. Why are you wet? What's going on? You know, I was like, what's wrong with you? So I kind of had to just wait it out. But I was so happy. Um, you know, it, it, it was amazing uh, coming to that saving faith in, in Jesus. You know, but Jewish people, you know, we really don't know. We don't understand. We don't know the story. We only see it through the persecution and the suffering. You know, we see it through, um, you know, the pogroms, like my family experience, or the, or the Holocaust, which my father, in a sense, was, was aware of, or the Inquisition, or the Crusades, or so on. You know, and that is not the real Jesus. That is not the real church. Those are not real followers of the Messiah. And so we, you know, we mustn't, you know, or, you know, I mean, I have it all the time. I've had staff, new staff come into uh, work with us administratively and say, well, the Jews did kill Christ. And they don't understand how that sounds to a Jewish person. I'm like, well, actually, technically we didn't. The Romans did. And uh, theologically, we all killed him. Well, actually, he gave up his life, you know. Um, and so saying things like that, you know, um, I said, I'm not going to give you a list of do's and don'ts, but I'll just say that one. Like, don't really say to a Jewish person, you know, the Jews killed Christ. I mean, first of all, it's not really true. It's not accurate. And secondly, imagine if you were on the receiving end of that, your people were responsible for the, the death of the Son of God. It's, it's, uh, it's, not really, it's not really helpful. I'm going to say this is another pointer, though, and this probably has come up through my talk anyway. When it comes to uh, Jewish people, you don't really need to know everything or anything. I mean, it's helpful to know some things, but you don't have to know anything about Judaism. I tell you what, Mark, just as he thought Jesus was going to ride on a horse through the sky and he was going to be riding next to him on a horse... And hey, maybe that's going to happen. I'm not here to talk about that kind of thing. I'm just here to say some things you don't really necessarily need to talk about to people who aren't in. Okay? You don't really need to know a lot or anything about Judaism. It helps to know a few messianic prophecies, like I said, Isaiah 53, or you heard how Jeremiah 31 impacted me, Psalm 22. Those are the three big ones. You could talk about the virgin birth or whatever like that. But I mean, that's getting a bit technical, the virgin birth thing. Just keep it simple. Isaiah 53 you know, and maybe, you know, Jeremiah 31, that's good. You're good to go. Let your light shine. You know, that's really, it's just about being genuine and authentic. You don't really need to know about Judaism. Now, we're going to have Q&A in a minute, so I, I want to cut myself a bit short. Um, but I do, uh, I do want to say this. There's one thing that happened to me after I came to faith, uh, when, I, when Mark came back a couple of days later that I found out about, okay? So... I want to say that prayer changes things. This is the first lesson that God taught me as a new follower of Jesus, as a new Jewish Christian. I found out that for that whole year that I was reading the Bible and saying, God, if this is your word, speak to me through it. There was a woman called Nancy, and Nancy prayed for me every single day. Now, Nancy was the mother of Terry, who was best friends with Mark. And Mark told his youth group at church about this Jewish neighbor boy who was reading the Bible and asked them to pray. And Terry went home and told his mother, Nancy, and Nancy said, what? There's this Jewish boy? I love the Jewish people. I'm going to pray for him every day. And Nancy prayed for me every single day. And as soon as I came to faith, Mark said, you know what? There's a woman named Nancy who's been praying for you every day. She's going to be so excited. And I can tell you, like, when I actually told my family that I believe in Jesus, which took me about six months, it went over like a lead balloon. I mean, it actually went over like the Hindenburg. You know, it was like a big flame fest. It wasn't good. Uh, my father and our relationship was pretty much devastated, destroyed for like six years. Uh, I was forbidden to go to church. I had to hide my Bible in a slit of my mattress so I wouldn't get it thrown away. Christian teaching, because I was forbidden to go to church, on cassette tapes, hidden in my folded up socks. You know, um, it was difficult. And that's why I was secretly baptized and stuff. It was hard. I understand now that I'm an older person. Why my, you know, my father and I have a great relationship now, and, and I understand how he felt, and, you know, we, you know, it's good. And I speak to him every day on FaceTime now that he's really, really old, and uh, I call him every day, make sure he's good, and he is. But, you know, none of my family agree with me, 
in my faith, despite all the years of, you know, you know, I'm not sure if it's down to me just being a really bad Christian or uh, whether it's, you know, I mean, it's a work of God, isn't it? I keep praying now. Prayer changes things. Every day I pray God put someone in their life who will be a witness, like Mark was to me. Put someone in their life because a prophet's without honor in their own home, and I'm certainly not going to, you know, um, I have great relationships with my family, but when it comes to me talking about my faith, come on, that's, you know, for whatever reason, it's, it's still, it's still not, not the thing. But um, prayer changes things. Nancy's prayers, I believe God used to, to take the blindness from my eyes and to soften my heart. And, uh, and, and so much so that whenever I've been involved in a ministry, we've always made prayer central and it, resourcing people's prayers. We were in prayers this morning um, before this session, and I was asked to come up and uh, I gave a couple of prayer requests for two real Jewish people who've recently come to faith. And it's great to know that they're they were prayed for, because I, I know that prayer helps. And so what we created in our mission is something called Watchmen, which is based on Ezekiel 33, 7, where God says to the prophet, he says, uh, you need to warn them. You need to warn them in verse, uh, verse 7. Uh, verse 8 says, because if you don't, their blood's on your hands, but I don't want to be the bearer of bad news. Let's just stick with verse 7. You just need to warn them. And so uh, part of the way that we find our warnings to Jewish people to acknowledge the Messiahship of Jesus, the way that that is even more successful is through people's prayers. And so we create a resource for people who sign up um, so that they can pray for real Jewish people every day, Jewish people who are seeking, like I was. Um, you get the name, you get the context, and you, so you know how to pray, the prayer request. And so I'm, all the Jewish missions, I'm sure, in this country um, they all um, have a way for you to be able to pray. And I would want to encourage you, prayer changes things. Find a way, even if you don't have Jewish people anywhere near you, maybe you're not down in London or Manchester, um, you know, uh, you can still be praying and making an impact in Jewish people's lives all over the world. Just a prayer a day, just, just 20 seconds a day will make a difference. So, you know, find, uh, please find a way to, to at least, you know, do that. Um, have that heart of Paul, my heart's desire and prayer to God is that they might be saved, that Israelites might be saved. You know, I'm not going to argue about Romans 1.16, oh, to the Jew first. I don't really care. So, share us the gospel last. Just share it with us. I don't care what order you do it in, but please make sure we hear the gospel because Jesus is the only one who saves. And I am the example that he does save Jewish people. And I can tell you, as a mission, we're not a giant mission. We've probably got maybe 15 missionaries. But, you know, um, we're seeing more and more Jewish people come to faith. We went from one a year eight years ago when I came into this role. And, you know, halfway through this year, we're already almost up to, I think, 25, 30. You know, so, um, and, I mean, the war in Ukraine, as I was saying, saying last night, we've seen Jewish people come to faith there in Moldova. Jewish people all over the world are, are professing faith by God's grace. So, you know, please don't forget us as a people. Please pray for us. And, you know, if you have a Jewish friend or neighbor, let your light shine. Don't be afraid. Don't be embarrassed. We actually admire the faith of other people. It's a challenge. It's a, it's a conviction to us to see that. God will use you, as he says in Romans 10. And how can they hear unless someone preaches? And how can they preach unless they are sent? How blessed are those, you know? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news? Right, so um, I want to leave a few minutes for questions. Um, we've got a roving microphone. And um, you can pretty much, I don't mind, just throw anything at me, and we'll see what we can do. If it's, uh, if it's too far off the, the, the subject, I might say, no, I'm not going to go there, but uh, let's see what happens. Hello, you can hear me. Wow, this is superb. Um, I'd like to make two points. One is a point, and one is uh, a question. Uh, you say chair, prayer changes things. One morning, um, I prayed that God would use me to witness, and um, I was walking in Winlatter Forest, and I went a bit off piste and came across a Jewish family um, with, you know, black hats and tassels and all the rest of, you know, half a dozen kids. Mm -hmm. And I was able to mention to them Isaiah 53 and they'd not read it and they promised me that they would read it. So you're right, prayer does change things yeah. or, or enable things. Yeah. The second point is, um, or it's a question, do you read the Old Testament in Hebrew? And if so, which do you think is the most reliable translation for English-speaking people? So, um, to your first point, 
just to say, I've got um, one of my best friends is Simon Ponsonby. I don't know if you know him. He and I studied at Trinity together. He's a pastor in Oxford. And um, he prays almost every day, God, please give me a Jewish person to witness to. There aren't that many Jewish people in Oxford, but he bumps into Jewish people all the time and is able to share. So I really think that prayer it might be whoever it is that God's laying in your heart, God, please give me a, a person with an Asian background to witness to, or God, please give me a, you know, but I think that God does answer those prayers. Your second question, um, so I studied Hebrew in my first degree in, my, in, in the Chicago at Moody Bible Institute. And I really struggled with it. I, I passed. I got. I passed it. But I tell you what, I haven't really looked at Hebrew since then. I read the Bible in English, and um, I use uh, commentaries and other things to help me draw out the Hebrew. Having learned for two or three years studying it, I have enough there. But I don't read the Bible in, in Hebrew, so I couldn't really answer your your question beyond that. Bible in English. You don't read the Bible in English, did you say? I do read the Bible oh, in do? English, yes. Wh which I don't read it in Hebrew. Right, which version do you use? I, I skip around. I, try to, I like to compare. Okay. And also, because I speak in a lot of churches, um, for that week, if I know what version they use, then that's the version that I'll be studying and preaching from. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Joseph. I missed the middle bit, but I'll get the live stream. Apologies if you address this. I came in at the bit where you talked about the Jews not killing Jesus. Yeah. I think you're right. I think it was the leaders. And there's a picture of this when Reuben hands over Joseph to the Ishmaelites. They don't kill him. But I wanted to ask you uh, covenant theology. Gentiles obviously disagree on the whole relationship between the Jews and the Gentiles from secessionism right up to dispensationalism. But I was interested to ask as a Jew where you would sit on the spectrum of people of Israel, symbolic Christian land, all that kind of area? Well, I'm very much from a reformed background, and we're a reformed mission, you know, so I mean, I have that perspective without spending too much time going into the theological side of that, but I don't believe that we have been replaced, as I read from Jeremiah, but I believe I see the church spanning back into, into Jewish people and into faith before Christ, if that makes sense, yeah? Sure. Sorry. It's working now. Okay. Um, again, I have two points. Uh, one question is coming, coming into relationship with the Messiah, do you feel that that has expanded and given you more depth of the Old Testament and a revelation of what the, the scriptures that Christ preached over, um, because obviously he spoke from the Old Testament, um, do you feel that that's made your relationship with the Messiah and God even richer based on your education and experience from a Jewish history? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I'm so grateful to God that I spent that first year in the Old Testament before I got to the New. And it's kind of like, you know, how can you really enjoy cake if you only eat the icing? You know, you want the experience of the meat of the cake, the bread part, and the icing on it. And, you know, how are you going to understand? I've seen so many people who only read the New Testament misunderstanding things because they haven't got the context of the old. And you see this in Hebrews where you've got a context that's been set up for, you know, a couple of thousand years with sacrifices. Oh, they could never take away sin. They were offered daily. But that's why Jesus is the once and for all time. But if you weren't aware of the sacrificial system, you know, we go around and we talk about, I've written this talk called Gospel in the Passover. And uh, we go around and we share that in churches. And the insights that people get to communion from us looking at Passover, both historically from the Exodus, but then how Jesus took it and used it in the New Testament and the institution of the New Covenant, all that stuff just plays into a very deep faith and a following of Jesus in that way, yeah. Hi. I only came into the second half of your okay. speaking, so I don't know if you've already covered this, but would I be correct in your understanding as well that uh, Judah and Israel were split and as a Gentile collection uh, of people we would be grafted into Israel as Israel was the dispersed people and that is the the root of where we come into the Old Testament whereas Judah is, is, is the Jews I wouldn't necessarily say that's how I saw it um, I think that we're, I see us grafted into Christ, or we're regrafted into him, um, you know, in, in, in that sense. But again, I'm not, uh, there's not the time to expand into all that. And, you know, I really want to keep this focus on evangelism more than some of the different theologies. You were first. 
Thank you. Hi, brother. Hi. Um, so, uh, Daniel Nine, I, I don't know how, how useful is it. But, um, it seems to suggest that uh, the Messiah would come after the rebuilding of the temple, which was future at that point, but before the destruction of the third temple. Um, but Are they you don't talking believe... about Daniel's prophecy there? Yeah, Daniel 9. Um, it can be useful. I mean, obviously, our missionaries, uh, we spend a couple of years training them in apologetics and in these various messianic prophecies. And if a Jewish person is really that um, interested or involved, then, of course, that can be helpful. But, you know, again, someone like me who's not religious, who's just aware of their alienation from God and longing for a relationship and a hope for the future, um, you know, there are more simple and key passages without having to get tangled up in, in all the, the maths of that passage in Daniel. But they are doable. You know, I mean, obviously, I know the arguments there. I know the arguments about the, vir the virgin birth and the various Hebrew words that you can argue about and what they mean. And, and obviously, you know, you've got the Shema. You're talking about the Trinity and the word Achad and, and all sorts of different things, which now I'm like, blah, 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 talking like a, you know, Snoopy's, you know, teacher or something. But, but to be honest with you, all that stuff I leave to the side because it really doesn't, doesn't matter in the sense that you can effectively share the good news with a Jewish person by loving them and sticking to the good news, you know, by sticking to the gospel, that we are sinners alienated from a holy God, that God has provided a way through his Messiah. He was the once and for all time sacrifice. And, you know, and, le and you know, there, there can be a context. And even looking into the New Testament, um, you know, a lot of our missionaries are studying the gospel of John or the gospel of Matthew and just helping Jewish people see Jesus through who he is. So here, and, and why is it that so many Jewish people from a former Soviet background have come to faith over the last number of years? Because they didn't get all that other gumph that traditional Judaism teaches us, the fear of Jesus, the fear of Christians, all this stuff, didn't get in the way. They didn't have any context. So when we come in with the gospel, there's not all that stuff to overcome. And so there's this amazing openness amongst that particular Jewish, you know, uh, sector. You know, and I think that says a lot about what we can do in terms of just being willing to share the simple gospel and God's love with anyone, including Jewish people. Yeah? Sure. I'd like to say thank you so much for the privilege of you coming here. Thank you so much for the pleasure your time. To be here. When we're dealing with Jewish people and we use the word Jesus, it is a curse word to them. Should we not use the true Hebrew name Yeshua, which means salvation? I don't think that we can say carte blanche, it's a curse word. I think that it's a word that can cause fear, but it was used with me and I was, you know, by God's grace. Again, don't forget, we're working with the Spirit. If God's working in a person's heart, I believe, in, I believe in the election of God. If God's working on someone, you come in, God's going to overcome that. Even, you know, if you're talking about riding a horse through the sky to the uninitiated, God can work through that. So I wouldn't get to, you know, we use Yeshua in Israel, but Jewish people in Israel call him Yeshu, which means may his name be blotted out. We would never say it. We would never use that for Jesus. We would always use Yeshua. So even then, when we use Yeshua in Israel, it's, it, you could see that as a, an offensive word. That's why they don't use it. But we still do, and God's still saving more Jewish people in Israel probably than anywhere else. So I wouldn't necessarily worry about that too much, personally, if that's helpful. Uh, I was born again in 1976. But, uh, sadly... I've only met a very small number of, of Jews. Uh, my heart is very much in street work and sharing the gospel. Uh, something I've come across a small number of times is that uh, when you speak to a Jewish person, a small number of them raise the issue of um, the Third Reich and say that, uh, well, the Germans in the Third Reich, they were Christians and look what they did. Do you have an answer to that? Well, Jesus said, you'll know my followers by their love. And a lot of people use his name, but they're not true followers. Do they demonstrate love? No, they didn't. You know, uh, and there's plenty of examples of, you know, people murdering. It's like people saying, uh, religions cause war. Really, I mean, you don't think atheists have ever started a war or fought in a war? I mean, you know, there's all sorts of blanket things that people say as a guard, as a shield. But what you have to get past that. You have to get to the... You know, you have to find a way through friendship, I believe, to get past that, to have real conversation and a real relationship. 
You know, most of the work, I mean, I would say 99.9% .9 of the work our missionaries do, it's a one-to-one -one Bible study with people that we're building relationships with. We're not seeing people just suddenly come to faith on the streets. You know, the people I, I shared prayer requests today, there are people that we've been sharing with between two, four, five years before they've come to faith in the last few weeks. They're not people that we've just met out of the blue that just suddenly said, yes, uh, I'm Jewish. I want to believe in Jesus right now. So you have to build up a relationship. That trust comes through that and then through the sharing, through the intentionality of opening up the scriptures, of being vulnerable and sharing your faith, your struggles, your life as a follower of Jesus. That's what, that's what God used for me as I was reading the Bible and watching my friend Mark even be crazy sometimes. Yeah. I think we're out of time. I see your hands, and I'm happy to stay around and talk. We're in a, we're in a space. I'm not rushing off anywhere. So if you want to ask your questions of me, I'm still going to be here. But I also want to respect that there's a schedule. So I do apologize. If I would have known there would be so many questions, I, I would have made my talk a bit shorter. I, do, I, I am sorry about that. But shall I just end us in a quick prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who saves. Lord, I want to thank you that in two years, uh, sorry, two days, be celebrating 43 years of you showing me day in and day out that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Savior. He is Lord. And Father, I thank you that for, you know, look around this room, uh, all of us, Lord, you've brought your truth into our hearts, into our lives. You've made us followers. You've saved us. You've redeemed us. You've converted us from sin to righteousness. Lord, we thank you. We rejoice in your salvation. And we pray, Father, that you would help us to continue to grow in a knowledge um, of, of your love, of Jesus' messiahship, of his saviorhood. Lord, help us to continue to be faithful followers and to trust you in the work of your spirit enough to make your name known amongst the people that you've put in our lives, whether they're friends, whether they're neighbors, whether they're work colleagues, whether they're people at the gym or wherever. Lord, help us to shine our light, the light you've given to us. And help us to lift Jesus up so that people will be drawn to him. Be exalted, we pray. We commit ourselves to you again to make Jesus known. In his name, amen. God bless you and thank you so much. <laughs>